Most of us spend our lives feeding off our moods. Looking for happy moods, because those are the fun ones to feed on. But once you've put the mind in a position of feeding off its moods, you find that it's got a lot of other things to feed on as well. Depression, sorrow. Once you create that kind of mouth and stomach for the mind, hoping to feed off the good moods, it's open to take in the sad moods as well. You find this in your daily life, you find this in your meditation too. The reason we do this is because we feel that moods at least create the spice of life. If the mind didn't have moods, we'd feel like we were robots. The idea of a mind without moods sounds like oatmeal without any anything added to it, i.e. pretty miserable, pretty dull. But when you stop and think about the dangers of our moods, I mean, they can really induce us to do all kinds of unskillful things. If we get really depressed, we get apathetic. Nothing seems to matter. You lose any sense of concern about the results of your actions. When you get really happy and manic, you get complacent. And again, you lose any concern for the results of your actions. So you end up doing and saying things that can cause harm very easily. And then you're stuck with the results. And it keeps going on through a cycle. There's the action, and then there's the result of the action, and then there's the mood or the defilement that results from the action. And then you act under the, the power of that mood or that defilement. And it creates more unfortunate actions, more unfortunate results. So when you realize that the mind is not just a feeder, but it's also a producer. It's not just a consumer, it's a producer as well. And if you're going to produce skillful actions, you've got to get the mind in a position where it's not a slave to its moods. And from this perspective, the idea of a mind free from its moods, well, it's just that. You're, it's a sense of freedom, not a sense of dullness. But a mind that doesn't have to be under the sway of its very undependable moods all the time. In the Thai tradition, they talk about a mind without moods as a mind at normalcy, which may sound strange to begin with, because for most of us our normal state of mind is to be under the sway of our moods. But this is a different kind of normalcy. It's related to the normalcy of the precepts. Because that word, the sila, is often also translated as normalcy in Thai. You're at normalcy when you're not killing, not stealing, not engaging in illicit sex, not lying, not taking intoxicants. It's a healthy normalcy. This is how the practice of the precepts connects to the meditation. We keep your mind in a balanced state. So it's not a slave to its moods. It doesn't lean over in the direction of happiness or lean over in the direction of sadness. There's a part of the mind that's just simply aware of these things when they come. And as a meditator, you want to cultivate that part of the mind, get in touch with it, so you can step outside of the moods. Because when you're in that position, you're in a much better position to say things and do things that are not going to be harmful for yourself or for other people. It's a position of freedom. That's the kind of normalcy we're working at. You want freedom to be the normal state of mind. So you practice this through the precepts, you practice this through restraint of the senses. Good and bad things come and you just learn how to watch them. So this is the way of the world. This is the normal way of the world. When you see that as normal, then your mind can be normal. 
like that chant we have, that we're subject to aging, illness, and death. The Thai translation is, well, this is the normal, this is the ordinary state of affairs. Aging is or ordinary. Illness is ordinary. Death is ordinary. When you learn how to see these things as ordinary, the mind can be in an ordinary state of normalcy. This is just the way of the world. This is the way things are. When things get really good, well, that's the way they are. But are they going to stay good forever? No. And part of you may want to ride the good mood as you would ride a wave when you're surfing. But then the wave runs out, and then what have you got? Well, you, you're just stuck there in the water. Or even worse, you can get smashed up against the rocks if you get it, a really strong wave. So when you look at the mind not simply as a consumer but also a producer, you've got to get in a position where it produces things well, produces things skillfully. In other words, your thoughts, your words, your deeds. It's like being a potter. You want your mind to be very still and not influenced by its moods if you're going to throw a good pot. If your mind leans in any direction, your hands are going to lean too, and the pot gets ruined. So as you meditate, it's important that you try to develop this sense of the observer and just simply watches and is not overwhelmed or overly impressed by anything that comes your way, good or bad. Rapture comes. Well, you watch it, and you realize that rapture has a cause. If you simply ride the wave of the rapture, that's it. You've had the thrill of the wave, and then when the wave gets out, where are you? Back where you started. But if you learn how to Stay with the breath and see that your focus on the breath is the cause of the rapture. The rapture will come when you need it and will go when you don't need it. You're more in control. You've been able to maintain your normalcy and at the same time you learn how to observe. The importance of this is that when bad moods come, you can also have that observer to depend upon, so you don't suddenly find yourself stuck in a, in a swamp of a bad mood. There's a part of the mind that's separate, at normalcy at all times. So no matter how bad the mood, you don't get apathetic, you don't get resentful, or whatever the bad mood may be. And so you don't do things under the power of that bad mood. It's a way of finding some freedom. And it acts as the basis for skill in your life. So no matter what comes up in your meditation, say, oh, there's this too. There's this too. And that puts you in a really good position when really special things happen. You don't get carried away. There's a passage in the Ken where the Buddha talks about people experiencing all kinds of wonderful things in the meditation, and they start identifying with them. And, and as a result, they don't get anything better than that. They start identifying, this is me, this is mine. And then you get stuck there. Of course, he says the proper attitude, whatever comes up in the meditation, is, oh, there's this. And if you learn how to have that attitude towards depression, learn how to have that attitude towards rapture, refined states of concentration, then when the deathless comes, you say, oh, there's this too. And you profit more from the experience. You want to keep your mind at normal state no matter what happens. Because that puts you in the best position to react in the proper way, react with skill, react with heedfulness. There's a book, Arctic Dreams, by Barry Lopez. He talks about spending time with the natives in Alaska. He says there's a quality that they all had, which he had trouble finding a proper English word for. 
is that they all had this kind of quality of watchfulness, a sense that there are dangers out there, but at the same time not being overwhelmed by the dangers. I think what he was getting at is that what in Pali they call apamata, and the English translation of that is usually heedfulness. He said that's their normal state of mind. Now in civilization we tend to lose that. We tend to get very complacent. But for people living in the wilderness, heedfulness is normal. You're not overly carried away by good moods because you know that there's a danger that comes when you get complacent. As for the bad things that come, well, you learn how to take them in stride. You try to find that center of the mind that says, oh, there's this, there's this, and keeps watch because there's, there's other things as well. And whatever this is, if it's conditioned, it's going to change. So try to have this quality of watchfulness as your normal state of mind. And if you're going to feed on anything, learn how, learn how to feed on that, the sense of freedom that comes with it. It's not unseasoned oatmeal. It's clarity. It's freedom. It lies in that direction. And you find that it really is your refuge. No matter what comes your way. 